There is a common pattern that you often see in nature called the Voronoi Diagram. If you've never heard of this before, or need a refresher, here is a visual walkthrough. Imagine a set of points in space. Let us assign each point a unique color. Now imagine a little agent. This agent has a paintbrush and will paint the area directly below it the same color as the closest point. So in this instance, the agent is one unit from the red dot, two from the blue dot, and five from the yellow dot, and so on. So it paints the area under it red. Now imagine that this agent moves all around the entire screen and continues to paint the color corresponding to the point that it is nearest to. The entire canvas will create what is called the Voronoi diagram of the set of points. It's kind of fun when making these on a computer to move the points around and see how the diagram changes. The special property of this diagram is that for every one of these cells of color, anywhere within the cell is always going to be closer to its corresponding point than any other point. The reason why someone like a business would want to use a diagram like this is so that they could compare the area that they serve with other businesses. If we say that each of these points is bakeries, the diagram would show us where customers are most inclined to buy their bread, assuming distance is the main factor. There is another way that a Voronoi diagram can be created that will reveal why it is so common in nature. Imagine a set of points, but instead of a little agent like before, imagine that all these points are emitting paint at the same speed as each other. The paint will grow in a radial pattern, forming a perfect circle until it meets another color. At that boundary, it will stop growing there and continue to grow elsewhere. This process will also form a Voronoi diagram, with the same properties as our first diagram. The reason why is because every point on our canvas will be colored by the nearest emitter before any other point. In order for an area on the canvas to be a color different than what corresponds with the closest point, the other points would have to emit faster than that nearest point. This won't happen though because we define that the color must emit from all the points at the same speed. If you imagine that instead of paint it was a bacterial culture, or cells dividing, people roaming around, or even the formation of metal crystals, etc., you can see why it would appear so much in nature. If you're someone who wants to use Voronoi diagrams, you could write a program that draws on a virtual canvas using one of the two definitions, but the result would be limited by resolution, and it's not very accurate at small scales. Also, it's very slow as it calculates every single pixel. For you computer scientists, this would be considered to have poor time complexity. In this video, I want to work towards a new geometric understanding of one of the fastest and most precise ways to form a Voronoi diagram, called Fortune's Algorithm. As well, I'll show how the algorithm can be used in an unexpected way. Let's combine these two algorithms to help us gain a deeper insight. One way could be with algebraic functions. You likely have learned that the function for distance and the function for a circle are the same. In a 2D plane, the function for distance between x, y, and 0, 0 is the Pythagorean theorem. The square root of x squared plus y squared. If you want to find the distance between two points, x, y, and a, b, you would subtract a from x and b from y. If we want to use this function to draw a circle, we can use every location on the graph where the function is equal to a certain value. This value is the radius of the circle, and AB is the center. This function can act just like a Voronoi diagram with just one point of data. In our first example of a Voronoi diagram, we tasked an agent with finding the distance to every point in the graph, which is what our graph shows us, the distance to only one point. In the second example, we grew circles at every point of the diagram, which we can find in our graph by constantly increasing the radius. Obviously, it's not very useful to have a Voronoi diagram with just one point of data, because that doesn't allow you to compare multiple points of data. 
So we should probably try and combine two of these functions to make a new function that creates a Voronoi diagram with at least two points of data. What we're looking for in the Voronoi function of two points is just going to be that the two circles grow at the same speed as one another. And when the circles meet at their intersections, they should form straight lines and boundaries perpendicular to one another, as we saw in the beginning. Unfortunately, it's unclear how one would combine these functions. Adding two functions, multiplying, dividing, and even solving all fail to give us the correct results. The key is to look back and remember how the agent would tell us the shortest distance to the nearest point. What we need is a function that takes two points and tells us which is the smallest. The common name of the function that does this is called the minimum. And is used often in statistics, data science, and computer graphics. When given a set of values, it will return the smallest value. So to combine two Voronoi functions, we can just plug them into the min function. If we want to compare more Voronoi functions, we can actually just put more into the min function, as the min function generally has no limit to how many inputs can be compared. Though, if for some reason you are limited in the number of inputs, you could plug the min function into another min function to get the same result. What we've done here is find a way to describe the process of creating a Voronoi diagram with a more algebraic approach. However, we can't really use this algebraic description to create Voronoi diagrams. It's missing a key factor. The actual result of the Voronoi diagram is obscured because the min function only tells you the value of the smallest function and doesn't tell you which function is actually smallest. The assumption here is that the function is clearly not useful. But a direct comparison between it and the example shown earlier illustrates that there's clearly some similarity beyond the final result that needs to be explored further. Moving up a spatial dimension is a useful tool to help apply pre-existing knowledge. Let us try and look at our function in three dimensions. So instead of the left-hand variable being time, let's set it to z, which will be depth. This is 3D graphing. Imagine a horizontal plane of points, moving them all upward by the distance that our function equals at those x and y coordinates. It's easier if we imagine that this is a surface, such as if we placed a sheet of fabric over it all. You may be familiar with some of these more famous 3D graphs, which use the same principle to get these cool curves. If you want to play with 3D graphing calculators, I've linked one in the description. With our Voronoi function, I believe it'd be easier to see what's going on if we invert the z-axis. But keep in mind, the peaks are still equal to zero. Looking at our Voronoi function on the 3D graph, we see that it looks like a set of bottomless cones, except they overlap. We can see where the cones intersect with each other, we have those straight line boundaries that we're looking for, and the location of the points is on the top of these cones. To see where the graph is equal to a certain value, we can take the horizontal cross-section of the graph at a certain depth. Actually, the graph doesn't just look like a set of cones, these are cones that have been placed in a maximum function. The function for a cone in a 3D graph is the same as our single point Voronoi function, with an additional coefficient that defines the slope of the cone. Because we're using this to define distance between xy points, we keep this coefficient at 1 for our Voronoi graph. With this information, we can take any set of points and create something similar to a Voronoi function by spawning in a bottomless cone at each of the points. To get the boundary lines of the diagram, we need to project these intersections up onto their own plane. So our goal now is to find out how we can effectively do that. We've made the connection between the Voronoi diagram and cones, so perhaps it's good to refresh ourselves on conic sections. There are four major conic sections. We've already discussed circles, but there's some more important details that we've missed. Relative to a cone, a circle is defined by the height of a horizontal plane that intersects the cone. A circle is formed by the cross-section of this plane through the cone. 
If we define a vertical line that goes straight through the center of our cone, we can plot its intersection on the horizontal plane, and you can instantly recognize that this point is the center of our circular cross-section. I think it would be useful to call this center point the focus of the circle. We'll keep note how a circle is defined by a point in a number that describes the height of the plane. Ellipses are formed in many ways. But relative to a cone, an ellipse is the cross-section of a plane through a cone at any angle less than the slope of the cone. Cones also have a focus, two actually. Unfortunately, the location of these foci are difficult to describe. So if you're curious, 3 blue, 1 brown has a video about it. But I want us to focus on what these conic sections have in common with the circle, because what we're searching for is something related to what we know is true. Ellipses can be related to circles in certain ways. However, in relation to the cone, there's almost nothing in common that the ellipse has with the circle. So we're going to ignore ellipses for now. Hyperbolas are kind of the weirder of the four main conics. Hyperbolas are the cross-section of a cone and a plane parallel to the center axis. And like the ellipse, it has two foci. In fact, the equation to generate a hyperbola is the same as an ellipse, but with subtraction instead of addition. Fortunately, the foci can be described relative to the cone as two lines that go through the center of the cone. Unfortunately, the angle of these lines has basically no relation to the cone or the plane and are based on the square root. So the hyperbola also has pretty much nothing in common with the circle conic. In fact, I'd say it has less in common with the circle, because the circle cannot be transformed into a hyperbola. And the focus of a circle, relative to a cone, does not even intersect the hyperbola's plane, unless the distance is zero. So we're also going to ignore hyperbolas. The last conic section is the parabola, and the one that I want to call your attention to as being special in relation to the circle. A parabola is the cross-section of a plane and cone that is at the same angle as the cone. Parabolas have one focus and one directrix. The focus is a point on the parabola's axis of symmetry, and the directrix is a line that is perpendicular to the axis of symmetry. Relative to a cone, the focus is found at the intersection between the crossing plane and a vertical line that passes through the cone. A special property of the parabola is that it's defined in a 2D graph as all the areas where the distance between the directrix and the focus is identical. As we discussed earlier, the distance to a point is the Pythagorean theorem. The distance to a horizontal line is simply y minus the line's y-axis location. So a parabola can be defined by all the locations on a graph where these two are equal. To visualize this, we could animate it where the two graphs are equal to an increasing number, and where the two graphs intersect, they are equal. Doing this, we find that the intersection traces out a parabola, with a directrix where the horizontal line started. We can also use algebra to solve these two equations and get a function relative to the y-axis, which is probably easier to visualize. Side note, this formula will form upwards and downwards facing parabolas. That's because this definition is for a double cone, and because our Voronoi function only produces single cones, we're going to ignore when it faces upwards. You likely learned in school that the function y equals x squared is parabolic. As it happens, in our special parabola function, the standard x squared is found when the focus is at 0, 0 0.25, and the directrix is at y negative 0.25. Looking back at the two formula for distances, instead of animating where they're equal, we can try and use 3D graphing again. If we plug the two separate functions into a 3D graph and set z value equal to their outputs, we will get a parabola as seen from the top where our 3D surfaces intersect. You will see we get a cone and a plane at the angle of the cone. I think it's amazing that the definition of a parabola has the 3D definition built into it. If the focus of a parabola is a vertical line that runs through the cone, where is the directrix? The directrix can easily be found if we know the location of both the focus and the bottom of the parabola curve. As a parabola is defined where the distance to the directrix equals the distance to the focus, the distance along the axis of symmetry between the parabola and the focus is the same from the parabola to the directrix, so we can draw a point here. 
Since the directrix is perpendicular to the axis of symmetry, we can just draw at this point. When we look back at the cone, we will know that this property must apply for all depths of the cross-section plane. If we look from the side of our scene here, where the plane of symmetry is facing us, we can see that the line that this directrix traces out is actually a reflection of the vertical line. All this is to say is that the directrix is the plane relative to the cone that the cross-secting plane intersects to create a directrix line. Relative to the vertical focus line, the directrix plane is twice the angle of the parabola slope. If you remember from our Voronoi diagram of cones, every unit away from the cone center goes down one unit, meaning the angle of our Voronoi cones is 45 degrees, and the directrix plane is horizontal to the cone. That may not seem particularly important that the directrix plane is horizontal, but if you remember earlier, the points on the Voronoi diagram are all on the same horizontal plane. So when we compare two or more 45 degree cones, they all have the same directrix plane, which cannot be said about the other cone angles, making the parabola especially important for finding the Voronoi diagram. Let's look back at the Voronoi diagram of cones, and instead of using circles, use parabolas. What that means is that we'll add a plane angled at 45 degrees relative to the horizontal plane. If we move this 45 degree cross-section plane downwards over time, we can look at the cross-section to get the result. The boundaries of the Voronoi diagram, also known as cusps or valleys, are where the parabolas intersect each other. The parabolas all share the same directrix because we prove that all the cones have an identical horizontal directrix plane and the focus of the parabolas are the Voronoi points. As well, the directrix moves at a consistent speed along the graph. Actually, since the directrix is an intersection between the directrix plane and the cross-section plane, we can define the location of the cross-section plane by the location of the directrix. Since we know the formula to generate a parabola given the directrix and the location of the focus, we can draw a parabolic function for each of the foci. Similarly, with the issue of generating the Voronoi function, this parabolic function only makes one parabola. To combine these parabolas, we want a function that we can plug them into that will tell us which is the largest at any given point. The name of the function that does this is called the maximum, which is the opposite of the minimum, telling us what the largest point is at any given value. Highlighting the cusps of this function will show us the intersections of these parabolas and where the boundary of the Voronoi diagram is. The reaction I had when I first saw this was shock at the fact that these parabolas draw straight lines. And I assume many of you will also be shocked. I think most people would assume that the intersections of two parabolas that share a moving directrix would draw something curvier, but no. When both parabolas share a directrix, they will form a straight line. While it's theoretically possible to prove this with algebra, creating a formula that finds the x value of the intersection between two parabolas and sticking it into a parametric function and finding its derivative, that is a monumentally difficult task for a human, at least of my skill level, and most calculators are not helping out much. So instead of further torturing a computer, we can instead try to think of why this would be true in a geometric way. If we go back to one of the examples of how a parabola is formed on a 2D graph with a growing circle in line, we can bring in a second circle to form our other parabola. If these two share a directrix and the cones they are equivalent to are similar, that means their circles will grow at the same rate and will be identical in size. After all, they use the same distance formula. And we will find that there is a point of intersection, two actually, where the two circles share an intersection with the moving line. This is where the two parabolas intersect. If we move the original directrix location, this property stays true. If you remember from doing geometry with the compass and straight edge, you can find a perpendicular bisector between two points by drawing two identical circles centered on one of these points and drawing a line between those intersections. And this works regardless of how big the circles are, as long as they intersect. This is basically what is going on with the parabolas here. The intersections will stay on this perpendicular bisector. This also gives us some validity to the fact that these parabolas are actually drawing a Voronoi diagram, because the Voronoi diagram between two points is the perpendicular bisector. 
In fact, if you were to draw a Voronoi diagram in real life on pencil and paper, you would create it by drawing a bunch of perpendicular bisectors. By the way, if you want to play around with this proof in another algebraic proof, I have linked to an interactive Desmos graph in the description. Back on a tangent, all this means is that we have a function for generating Voronoi diagrams that are analogous to our circular function from earlier. To find the cross-section of the cones with this new function, we move the location of the directrix over time, where in earlier Voronoi functions, we increase the value being solved over time. The reason this new Voronoi function is so special compared to the original is that it's a y equals function. It passes the vertical line test, which the original doesn't. So if we want to find all the boundary lines of our Voronoi diagram, we move the directrix and draw a pixel at all these little cusps, which is a significant complexity improvement over the previously mentioned ways of finding a Voronoi diagram, because now we're not analyzing every single pixel, but now analyzing every location that the directrix will go through. Actually, it's even better if we find aligned segments by strategically moving the directrix to specific locations just before and on each foci. This is how a proper fortunes algorithm works and has a time complexity of n log n. If you know what that means, it's a massive improvement. And now, since they're using proper line segments and polygons, we've solved the issue of limited resolution, as Fortune's algorithm could be used to computationally find a Voronoi diagram in vector-based environments, like computer-aided designs such as Fusion 360, Illustrator, or 3D software such as Blender. I want to leave you with an extra way to use Fortune's algorithm to vastly increase the usefulness of Voronoi diagrams. The Pythagorean theorem is not the only way to find distance between two points. What matters is what we consider distance. If you want to find the distance between 14th Street and 8th Avenue and 23rd Street, 6th Avenue in New York City, it doesn't make sense to say that the distance is 3,000 feet, because that goes through buildings. You're not going to be walking like this. It's more appropriate to say 4,000 feet. It's the horizontal distance plus vertical. This metric of finding distance is called the taxicab distance, or a Manhattan distance because of how it works on grid like systems. The formula to find taxicab distance is the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y, or displace it as the absolute value of x minus a plus the absolute value of y minus b to find distance between two points. This taxicab formula is somewhat similar to the Pythagorean theorem. If we set it to a value, we can create a circle in taxicab space, meaning that the distance in taxicab metric between the center and any point on the edge is always going to be the same. We can also use the same rationale earlier to create a cone in taxicab space. And we can now use it to find conic sections in taxicab space. This is what a parabola looks like in taxicab space. For the parabola here, the definition of the intersections of a growing circle in a directrix creates an identical image. So how about trying to make a Voronoi diagram with these taxicab parabolas? We can use Fortune's algorithm to create the boundary lines of a taxicab Voronoi diagram. This is what it would look like compared to a Euclidean Voronoi diagram. For a more practical example of how we can use this Voronoi diagram, imagine that each of these points is a Starbucks. The Voronoi diagram will describe where people are most inclined to go. People in this sector are more likely to go to this Starbucks than people in this sector are to go to this Starbucks. A taxicab Voronoi diagram like this can be especially useful for businesses that operate in cities with a grid-like road structure, as they can tell you where customers are most likely coming from.